Um, so thank you for your coming to our session here. Uh, as we all know, it's been a great two days of FinTech Nexus, and we're you know, delighted to be here. Uh, as we all know, it's been kind of wild times in FinTech over the course of the last 24 months, we'll say, Steve. And uh, I think we'd all like to hear from Steve you know, okay, what's the reality of where we are today, and then where do we think we might be going, and where are there possible opportunities in the future? You know, is this distressed, but distressed on the way up, or is this distressed, you know, on the way down? So, so why don't we start with sort of discussing, and we, and we can separate out, you know, financings from M&A. Um, I know we're squinting in the lights. <laughs> um, why don't we start by sort of talking about what is the status of the market today and what are you seeing? Status of the market today, good question. Um, well, look, it, it, it doesn't need to be said, but I'll say it anyway, how, how rough things are out there. Um, and uh, we all generally know why we're there. There was a huge run up for 10 plus years in valuations and and um, you know, hockey stick projections that ultimately didn't come true in a lot of instances. And so the, as I keep saying, the, the age old, uh, you know, buy low, sell high wasn't exactly adhered to the entire time. Um, and uh, it was a little bit of a, you know, raise high and, 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 and wait until the market blows up. You know? <laughs> and so, you know, unfortunately the market has blown up a little bit. It's, it very much feels like, I haven't seen anything like this rough since the dot-com bust you know, back in the day when I first um, was at Goldman and started up FT Partners. But, you know, and again, I'm not trying to get to the end of this, which is like, oh yeah, this is a great time to start a company. It is, it was a great time to start FT Partners in 2002. Um, but, but, you know, back to reality, you know, things are pretty rough right now. And, you know, we, as you all know, probably we, we produce a lot of data and information and, you know, we have tremendous amount of insight on what the activity is. And when you look at all the bar charts of how financing activity went up and M&A activity went up and now it's kind of come down and every quarter it just keeps going down and down and down, what you don't realize is, you know, the, the bars were, were this high before, now they're this high, but what's in the bar that's that high is a bunch of down rounds, inside rounds, inflated rounds, debt deals, you know, counted as equity deals and a bunch of hot company deals for, for you know, AI-driven companies and things like that. And there's not that much in there at all related to you know, a $50 million round for a company growing 35%, you know, burning 20 million. You're just not seeing investors chase after those kind of deals right now. So even if it's a really good, healthy company to some extent. So I think what happened you have to kind of like rewind it a little bit, you know, because I think there's been such a big downdraft in public market valuations from, you know, the IPO market to the SPAC market. Um, and that's where people were really basing a lot of their valuations. And so since those numbers came down, um, it's, it's, it, it's caused a big freeze in the private markets too. So people aren't sure where the exits are. So why put money in if you're not sure where the exit is? So, you know, I think that's caused a lot of VCs um, or all VCs and growth equity investors to sort of look at their portfolios and sort of, you know, first and foremost, do, do a little bit of a panic moment and say, is, is everybody okay? Who needs capital? Who needs this? Who, need, who needs some love? Who needs a new, um, you know, a new round or whatever? And, and it turns out that, you know, the VCs and, 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 and you don't really have the appetite to back every single company in their portfolio. Um, they're, they've got too many companies and you can't just go put another X into all of them. And, and sometimes when you have a complicated capital stack and you've got four rounds all stacked on top or peri pasu, and you got people with different funds at different points of view and different, different entry points, there's a lot of disagreement at the boards. And so it leads to a lot of stagnation of you know, helping these companies out. And what I've seen in a lot of instances is you know, the, the, the investors don't realize, well, you, you guys really own the majority of the company, so it's your company. But they all kind of look at the CEO uh, and say to him or her, like, hey, what are you going to do? You know, how are you going to get us out of this? Um, how are you going to turn this around? And, and so I, it, it's, there's some really difficult conversations going on right now in the, in, in the world of, you know, capital raising and, and M&A, which we can get to. But, um, um, and again, I think the theme of all this, yeah, it's, it's rough. It's not all doom and gloom. And there's like a lot of really good things going on. There, there really are a lot of good things going on. So we, we'll, we'll get to that. But I just think the, the market's really, really dry right now. And I think it's a shame to some extent that the VCs and, and growth equity folks are, are not 
leaning forward. I think they're missing out on some really good opportunities. I'm seeing some really good companies that are, um, you know, that if, if that I think if they had the capital, um, they could recover and perform quite well and become real real companies. There's a company um, that we know. It's not a client of ours. Um, we actually turned this deal down because we thought it would be tricky, but there was a deal. They hired a very brand name Bulge Racket Bank to sell the company. It had real revenue. It wasn't burning that much money. There just wasn't anyone in the world that would give these guys $25 million at, a reasonable, at any valuation. Um, and nor did anybody want to buy them. And so, you know, they may just go out of business. And so, you know, or, you know, they get bought for a dollar or do an aqua hire or something like that. But this is, you know, there's companies like this that I'm seeing that are just really struggling. Um, and it's not because they don't deserve the capital. They just haven't gotten the capital. And, you know, there's probably, uh, uh, anyway, I'll, I'll stop there for a second because I don't want to go too, too deep on this stuff. But I think it, it is, it is it, to paint the picture, it, it's a tricky moment for raising capital of any kind right now. So people are having to resort to, you know, different strategies. So let, let's come back to what can you do and what are the green shoots and the positives. Before we get to that, strategic acquirers or PE funds that might be interested in acquiring a platform, you know, what's happening out there? Is, as valuations have fallen, are there interested strategic acquirers? Yeah. Well, you know, before I hit that, you know, back to the financing side, you know, to the green, green shoots. I mean, yeah, there, right. you know, Everyone says, well, the market's frozen. I was saying the same thing. But like, yeah, of course, ChatGPT is raising tons of money and lots of AI companies. So it turns out that even when the market is tough and even in, when everyone's licking their wounds and, and quote unquote, no one's getting capital, if you have the right business model on the right day and the right you know, situation, you, you, you know, there is capital going to certain companies. We just raised $125 million. It was massively oversubscribed for a company at $2.5 billion that had literally no revenue at all. Uh, not because they lost all the revenue, they just never had it. it just the, the optimism around the story was was quite um, quite high. Um, even though we got turned down by many many investors, we still got multiple investors to come in, and some still banging on the door because the story itself, you know, was was quite interesting. So a, a lot of it is you have to kind of willpower yourself to success and to capital, um, which is what they and we did in that case. On the M&A front, you know, I, I love the example of uh, a, a cabbage, and I'm not trying to just toot our own horn here, but it, it was a deal where in the, in the absolute complete depths of COVID, you know, they lost all their, their, their capital lines and all the SMBs were freezing up and going out of business and their revenue went to basically zero except for some of the PPP stuff. And we ended up selling it to Amex for an undisclosed, fairly large price. And um, the... Uh, you know, and it was it was kind of live or die time for those guys, and and um, ultimately, you know, the, the, you know, you know, I, the founder is a very, you know, headstrong, you know, person. Co and the co-founders and both of them were very headstrong and, and and knew what they had built, and and we knew what they built. We believed in it, and they could either get bought for a dollar and, and distribute the cash out, or or do a deal. And we went to Amex and said, listen, you know, we have the technology, but you guys have all the customers, uh, you have, you've got 20 something million customers, you've got you know, 80 years of data, you've got uh, 50 other products to cross sell, you've got unlimited more or less balance sheet of cheap available capital, all the things that this company doesn't have but you don't have the technology stack that they have, right? And so you know, they thought they could buy the company for super cheap and we ended up selling it for not super cheap and so you know, they end up getting a, a really amazing deal um, given, the, given the situation. So that, that to me, that example goes to show you know, how important it is to get it right when you're trying to sell your company. And so from our perspective, there's a lot of things you need to do. And it's not just go hire FT partners. I mean, that, that's not the advertisement. The, the, the view is you got to get ahead of it um, mm -hmm. and you got to do the right things. You know, we, um, you know, on the more super positive end of it, you know, we just represented a company called Acorns, which I'm sure a lot of you have heard of by uh, for all stock, a company in the UK called Go Henry. So it was a cross-border deal. You know, one company's worth, you know, um, prior round multiple billions of dollars. The other company's in the, you know, uh, pretty significant valuation as well. You know, they looked at each other and said, you know, there's a lot of synergy here. Um, but you know, company A is not going to buy company B for all cash and have everyone you know, run off in the sunset. So they decided to merge for a stock for stock deal. Super complicated. Um, no one thought it could be done because each side had complicated capital stacks and complicated investor bases, um, two management teams on two different continents. Um, and uh, ultimately though, we did merge them together, stock for stock deal, uh, sizable deal. 
And I think you're, so, so you're starting to see some of those creative things. You either got to get really creative on the synergies with the buyer or creative on the um, uh, synergies with the merger target. Um, but you're, you're seeing a lot of this really creative deal making. You saw, so for example, Global Payments spun off a company called NetSpend, um, or sold a company called NetSpend. Well, they had a very hard time selling it, actually, um, because of the environment. So in, in a very weird move, Global Payments offered um, you know, 600 and something million dollars of, of seller financing to the buyer to get the deal done. So imagine a public company selling a company um, and saying, I know you can't you know, come up with all the money and the banks aren't lending right now, so we'll lend you the money. We'll just do a note um, and, 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 and fund you know, you know, two thirds of the deal. And then they had to go raise equity from, from Searchlight. So you know, you're seeing some really unique, interesting things happen on the, on the M&A front, but you aren't seeing tons of your regular way you know, m and I, I, I do know of multiple deals that are, that are coming on the pike that are sort of regular way, good, good deals and all that kind of stuff too, and we've been involved in a bunch of them. But um, you know, it, it, it's creative time, quite frankly. Yeah. And, and, um, so, and I would also say, because of the trickiness on the financing side and the trickiness on the M&A side, it, I mean, it used to be if I can't get financing, I'll just sell. Right, hire a banker, call 50 people, sell the company. That ain't working. Um, you need to really have curated your buyers, your demand, your relationships. Um, if you haven't, then you need to start doing things today to start doing those. You know, if, uh, on the cabbage thing, had we just sat around and called 50 people with the same, you know, 15-minute uh, pitch, and maybe we would have gotten nothing. But instead, we put together a 50-page document on all the synergies you know, for Amex and everything else, and we went straight to them. Um, and, and kind of you know, made that deal happen to some extent. Again, I'm not taking all the credit for it. The company and Amex did a massive amount of work to, to justify that. But, um, so it's, but there is no easy answer on M&A um, right now. I think the, the strategic buyers, I mean, think of the guys and gals running these companies. I mean, you've got like Square. They've been completely crushed on valuation. They made a big you know, quasi-mistake on the afterpay deal, paid a big price for it. You know, right before BMPL blew up, and, and now they got a big short report out on them. Their stock's way down. I mean, they've got cash, and they could make an acquisition, but they're probably trying to figure things out, right? And you know, PayPal CEOs like leaving. Um, their stock's way down. So you know, it's not like there's like massive amounts of incumbents either that have that have grown up and are buying things. You know, you get the really big successful companies like Audien and Stripe. You'd, you'd think that, okay, audience worth $50 billion, Stripe's worth, you know, it was 120, now it's 45 pre, you know, or 50. You'd think that they would be buying all these companies, right? But they're, they're really not. I mean, they'll do an acquire, they, they will buy a company once in a blue moon, but it's nothing you really have heard of, right? And so it, it, there was a moment in time where I think everyone thought all the really successful in, uh, fintechs that got really big would be the consolidators eventually of everybody else. And that, yeah market didn't stay around long enough for that to happen. So those guys kind of imploded a little bit, you know, and that's creating a tougher environment. And then you got JP Morgan is, you know, quote unquote defrauded, you know, um, and, and, you know, there's just a lot of tough stuff going on out there right now. So we're going to get to the green yes. shoots. <laughs> yeah. but, the last um, one minute will be positive news. Well, uh, okay. So let's say you're the CEO or part of the management team and you have 18 months runway or you're 15 to 20 months runway. And you've touched on this a bit. But what advice would you be giving uh, what they should be doing in addition to finding who potential strategics might be that they could be married to? I mean, what else they should they be doing to get from here to there? I mean, number one is that I think the CEO has to rally the board and the investors, right? Yeah. I don't think it's right for the CEO to be left out on an island and everyone to be looking at him or her and saying, what are you going to do, right? right. Right. I mean, the v, like I said this before, but like I think you've got to get together and and make joint decisions on what to do. We've seen a lot of companies where, you know, it, it just gets to be like the, the crowd doesn't really do its job of investors, where you know, they just kind of this guy thinks that the rest of the investors are are doing the, the tough work with the CEO, and these guys think the other four, mm -hmm. and and the CEO is kind of left out to do their own thing. And sometimes they're 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 not. You know, we're seeing that a lot. You know, where. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not recommending like Elon Musk style, you know, right, uh, you know, kind of cast offs of, of employees or anything like that. But, you know, you do have to do all the tough maneuvers, right? Mm -hmm. You're, this wartime CEO thing is, is, is a thing. And so and you've got to make all the right moves, like do it quickly on, on cost cutting or, you know, whatever have you in marketing and sales and, you know, 
cutting out R&D projects. And this is if you're running out of money and having issues, right? Um, so, uh, but I think everyone's got to kind of collaborate. But you got to make those tough moves early, yeah. um, and then show that you're changing your company. We we have a, a, a client of ours who. Uh, had a very big valuation, you know, uh, it's a crypto company actually, and, and it's a very, very good company. But then obviously crypto came down. So this is one of the like more legitimate, like um, more legitimate, uh, very legitimate, uh, <laughs> extremely legitimate uh, companies um, that, uh, you know, kind of, you know, did, did one of these jobs. And, but man, did they execute the heck out of their uh, cost cutting and retooling the technology, retooling risk management, doing things to get you know more compliant and everything else. And now they're coming out of it. They're really, really well positioned for the future. So, and the CEO basically said, like, I, the investors aren't helping me. I'm just going to basically um, get in there, and I'm going to be the chief product. I'm going to work with the chief product officer. I'm going to work with the chief marketing officer. He really yeah. just took the place by storm and said, we need to kind of rattle the cages and, and change everything we're doing. And, and now they're coming out of it, lean, mean, profitable, fighting machine, and they could have been done, right? So I think you got to move really fast, make the right decisions, get the board around. Um, and then, you know, I think it, it's funny, we're going to go raise money for this particular company. And one of the main things we're going to highlight about the company is just what an amazing job they did in the last six or yeah. seven months, kind of repositioning the company and getting in great shape. And now they're permanently profitable. And they shouldn't have been, they, they really just did all the right things. And so, uh, it's going to be, wow, what a resilient, incredible management team. Um, if you're going to back someone, back these guys for the next you know, 10, 20 years. You know, the other thing is, um, if you want to get ahead of the M&A game, you, you really got to start soon. You, know, yeah. you, you really don't, you, you, you're going to be in real world of pain if you wait until you've got three months of cash left to start you know, you know, hiring bankers or preparing or whatever. It, it's just the buyers are going to see it. They're going to see, that, okay, well, these four or five or six VCs around the table are now unwilling to fund the company. Um, they're doing last minute bridge rounds and they're just gonna like kind of renegotiate you down, you know, to, to, to a tough place. So I just think really, really getting ahead of that stuff and thinking through what is my, you know, we, we talk about deal DNA and situational DNA and situational strategy. You really gotta get the DNA right and then you gotta get the strategy yep. right. A lot of people, they don't diagnose the situation and then they do the wrong things. Um, and sometimes you diagnose the situation perfectly and then you don't do the right yeah. things either. It's, it's quite complicated, um, you know, to, to figure out. So um, so what's positive in the sense of, are we in inning two going to inning 10 and sort of the whole FinTech evolution? And where are you seeing interests? Like where are you hearing from strategics? These are areas where besides, I mean, AI obviously, right? But, but where, where are you seeing the greatest demand? And you would say, you know, uh, steer your company, if you can, towards this direction? Um, <laughs> uh, look, I think um, where, where management is really, really strong yeah. is the number one thing. Yeah. It's kind of what I was saying, right? So yeah. I'm repeating a little bit. But that's, that's what I'm seeing people go towards. You know, I, I had a, a drink or a water last night with a, a CEO who is an incredible CEO. And he's in a space where a lot of peers have gotten beaten down on valuation. Luckily, uh, this particular party, who's a client of ours, raised you know, a ridiculous amount of money in 21 and 22, and he's got a lot of money in the balance sheet. So, he, like, I'm not even thinking about my valuation. I don't need capital right now, and but I'm investing in everything. I'm going to make three acquisitions, um, and uh, and we're just putting our heads down and going. So there's, you know, this this to be a big flight to quality. So the yep. people that it's you know the people that have the money, who have the business model, who have the right you know management team are going to be getting a lot of the capital, which is going to make it tougher for the other crowd. Um, I do think though that um, y you don't want to be like what was me. I think I think for probably for every company that might be hearing this, uh, you know, that's having a hard time. You know, I I think you probably have a good business model and a good chance of success, but you need to find the investor that believes in you, just like when you were a Series A company mm -hmm. and you had nothing and you went out and raised money at you know 20 or 30 or 40 or 50 million pre. Um, you have a lot more than that today. You've got a lot of battle scars. You got a lot of, you know, you probably have real revenue and real customers and real tech. Um, y you know, it's a matter of finding the right party to back you. And in a lot of instances, quite frankly, that's going to be a strategic party, yep. right? Where they're maybe a little bit shy about writing a, a huge check to make you happy on the M&A side, but they might be willing to cut a reasonable check at a reasonable valuation if they really can get behind your story. So 
I would, I would in, uh, probably in the first instance, I would think about strategic investors. Um, and we're seeing a lot of activity from strategic investors right now. So, you know, um, I, I think that's a good way for them to bridge, not being able to buy companies and maybe companies to bridge, not being able to get traditional capital. So we're, we're doing and seeing a lot of those types of deals out there. So I think that's a good place. And those deals can then turn into, in a positive way, an M&A event down, down the road. So um, we're seeing that. I think in terms of sectors, um, uh, I clearly B2B a little bit more prominent than yep. B2C, obviously a little bit later stage, you know, path to profitability, all these buzzwords that are, that are nice to hear. But, um, you know, some of the stuff that's like a core part of the economy, like the fraud solutions players, like one of your companies, Feeds Eye, um, for example, I mean, you know, uh, uh, you know, there's obviously anything in payments and B2B payments. We just did two or three B2B payments deals um, are doing well. And I know this is a USA uh, FinTech Nexus um, conference, but, you know, in, in a weird way, um, the international scene and particularly emerging market scene is, is quite robust right now. India is not seeing the downdraft in stock markets that, that we are here. Um, we're, doing a, we're doing probably three deals in, in, in Africa right now that are all really positive, good outcomes. Um, and, um, and LATAM, we have some things coming up there. So, and we just did a deal in Singapore, a deal in Japan. So we're seeing a lot of yep. activity in emerging markets. Um, and that's where a lot of investors are going too. They're going where the growth is, they're going where the, yeah. Um, yeah. Well, and I think we're, we're both believers that we're gonna come out the other end of this. We're both believers that these solutions are needed and that they're, you know, you're beginning in a, of the adoption cycle and many of these verticals, you know, let alone internationally. So the, you know, the, 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 the job for today is to survive, if, if you're in a position where you have to survive from here to there, and you know, uh, if you're in a strong position, you're actually in a position to make acquisitions, to make your platform stronger, to actually come out the other side even in a better position than you might have come in, and take advantage of the particular situation. Yeah, I think, I mean, just, I think we can go over a little bit on time. You know, I think if your company is in a position to, you know, consolidate with some people of the same size or possibly pick up some of these companies that haven't managed those situations yeah. that well, you know, it could be a huge upside Correct. for you. You know, Correct. I mean, uh, the other company, the sister company that was actually bigger and, and you know, public and better, you know, on, on market cap wise was on deck to cabbage. Yeah. You know, they end up selling for about a, you know, a very a, a fraction of the price that we got for cabbage, despite that they were actually operating and doing okay. But the person who bought them was Enova. So yeah. Enova took advantage of it, bought them for like 100 million bucks, the most of it was in stock. And you know, it's my understanding is that business is now doing hundreds of millions of EBITDA, you know, um, post uh, financial cri the uh, COVID yeah. crisis. So there's potential to really pick up some really right. interesting assets and operate them the right way. Um, they had all the things that, you know, on deck didn't have. They, they, like I said, with Amex, they had capital, they had yeah. time, they had, asset back facilities that were all up and running uh, and not focused just on SMBs, but boy, have they completely crushed it. And then you look at like, you know, like a, a lend up, right? That thing was kind of a mess, right? They, they divided it into like lend up and then mission lane. Yep. Lend up obviously went out of business, yep. but had they not been savvy enough to like spin off mission lane and created like a, a, a really amazing, you know, uh, credit company. Um, so, you know, out of this can come really great things. That's why I said I think every single, I'm pretty sure every single company in this room that's, that's uh, trying to raise money or has a business model, you're not sure exactly what to do next. I think there is a solution yeah. um, for you. And even the ones that are doing well, there's a way you could do better. The ones that are doing great, there's a way that you could do tremendously great. You know, um, there's, there's always somewhere to go dig and, 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 and find greatness. So, um, and there's, I could give example after example after example. But I would also say that as much as this feels like the down part of the dot-com world, um, it also feels like the beginning of something big. I think yeah. um, I'm incredibly bullish. We're hiring, um, we're doing well. We've got, um, I just, I mean, our phone is like ringing off the hook and, and even just walking the floor, I, I, I met a whole bunch of great companies that I'd never even met before. And, 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 um, and so it's, it's I, I think we're in the, and I, I, I've said this for 20 years, I think we're in the first or second inning. Correct. You know, maybe we're in the bottom of the second now or something like that. And all the, all the solutions everyone's trying to, to go solve and all the TAMs, they're, they're all just as big as they ever were. The banks are probably not doing that great right now. And, and um, 
you know, the old Pfizer's and Jack Henry's and stuff, they're all merging and demerging. And, you know, there's a lot of disruption out there and less, so much opportunity, it's not even funny. So I, I think that um, we're in for another two decade run of FinTech. There will be blips in there, just like there was uh, um, in, the, in the last 20 years. But this is as bad as it gets. You just have to learn how to survive through this, but there's a yep. huge, tremendous opportunity on the, on the back end And to of this. take advantage of it. Position yourself and take advantage of yeah. it. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, everybody.